pleasure to, to announce uh, the opening of the second workshop uh, entitled How to Socialize the Banking Sector in Slovenia. Okay, I will put in Slovenia in brackets. We will, uh, our scope is more, more ambitious than that. Uh, we'll have two presentations first by our guests, Michael Roberts from the UK, uh, say famous blogger and a political economist, but also an insider in the world of finance. And uh, on my left here is Philip Herzog. Um, he's an assistant to an MP in the German Bundestag, uh, Mr. Axel Trost, uh, who is also uh, working with Philip on the matters uh, concerning the, the banking sector. Uh, so, I suggest you have your presentations first, and then we will proceed with the discussion in a manner uh, like in the previous, previous uh, workshop. So, my the floor is yours. Well, me first? Yeah, you first. Oh, oh I'm there was a sorry. misunderstanding. I'm expecting Philip yeah. to launch oh. off like a uh, We decided that your, uh, your <laughs> presentation is more general and... Uh, well, well, but, okay. well, I didn't do my lecture yesterday, Marco, and uh, I think most people, hands up anybody who wasn't there last night. Uh, I wasn't. Oh, right, okay, three or four. So I may have to cover things, but actually ha having your, your uh, presentation or your briefing notes, as it were, for this session, I thought it might be worth addressing some of my remarks to those, rather than going through the lecture for three quarters of the people again here at extreme length, uh, um, if, so that you don't... And I think Marco makes some very interesting points, as he wasn't here to, wasn't at, at the lecture last night, maybe there'll be aspects of what he puts, uh, which you've probably got in your hands here, that um, are not, that I took up, which are not in his, his briefing notes, but uh, we do get the general, the same points. He's raising really a lot of questions about the question of socialising the banking sector. Um, the basic proposition that I put forward in the lecture yesterday and I'm putting forward now is that we need to socialise the banking sector because banking is so important in a modern monetary economy to the needs of the people, basic banking, it's an essential part of a modern monetary economy, that it should be a public service, just like other parts of the economy are already public services, which people accept self-evidently should be like the health service, education, transport, and so on, depending on the country. The law is a bit different, but people recognize the need that the state should play a role in providing social need or a public good, which capitalism is unable to do, and in some cases unwilling to do, unless it's a massive profitable event enterprise for themselves. And so, but banking isn't seen like that. Banking is seen actually as the apex of capitalist accumulation. It reallocates the, the value created by labor and the profits appropriated by the productive sectors of capitalism, reallocates them and redistributes them in order to make it apparently more efficient and lower cost in the circulation of capital. But as we've seen, the development of modern banking has gone beyond just reducing the cost of circulation of capital, it's gone to the point we're actually engaged in a betting exercise. And the vast majority of the big multinational banks are not engaged in reallocating the sources of value in the most efficient way po possible. They're engaged in what is hedge fund activity, which is basically taking money from people who want to invest with it, and then betting on the stock market, the bond market, on all kinds of other markets, commodities, and then the derivatives of all those markets, what, betting on the price, and then betting on how far the price will go, and then betting on the option of that price, and so on, in a series of further and further out levels of betting. As I said last night, uh, in the UK, when you get into bed at 10 o'clock, which an old man like me does, around about 10, you put the television on, and uh, the channels that have advertising, of which the vast majority, thanks to Richard Murdoch, are privately uh, owned and therefore provide advertising. What are the advertising going on late? It's for people lying around in bed to gamble. And basically we have online betting, TV betting of all sorts. They're betting on everything you could think of. <laughs> basically that's what banking is 
are doing now. It's engaged in betting to try and get a bigger return for the shareholders and for the bondholders in that process. And the, the basic nature of banking to provide needs for people in terms of looking after their deposits, uh, making loans to industry so that they can invest, providing uh, loans for big ticket items that individuals have, whether it's the car or whether it's a home to live in and so on. Th those basic processes of retail and wholesale banking, commercial banking if you like, are reduced to a minority part of the aspect. One of the features in the UK is that the UK banks, the big banks, big five of them in the UK, uh, have assets of six trillion pounds. That's a huge amount, six trillion. The GDP of the UK is about uh, 2.4 trillion, uh, probably a bit, no, 1.4 trillion actually, a bit less. It's uh, so four times, 400% is the assets of the banks. How much of those assets are devoted towards helping industry, commercial sectors to grow? Only 200 billion or 3% goes in actual helping productive investment. The rest either goes to some extent on real estate and mortgage loans, but the vast majority goes on investing in all kinds of things across the world, wherever they are. Uh, uh, and also all those risk-taking assets which have led to the collapse of the banking system. So the, the, the we're starting from a point of view that banking does not operate in the interests of people, it doesn't operate in the interest of the most efficient way of organizing the economy. It doesn't produce value or help to, redu to reduce the cost of circulation anymore. It's a huge hedge fund gambling operation, which has lit takes economies down into the ground when, when the, the process collapses. And we've discussed that to some extent. That's a fundamentally simple proposal. How do we go about that? And the, the, the point made in, in my lecture, my point, is that we can't expect it to be a public service if it isn't publicly owned and it isn't democratically controlled and accountable to the people in some way. And uh, Marco's um, briefing notes actually then go on to deal with perhaps some of the intricacies of those two points, public ownership and democratic control, what sort of controls and accountability can, can we imagine? And the first point he makes is, of course, is that at the moment, Big multinational banks, their chief executives, their boards, their senior traders are paid grotesque amounts of salaries and bonuses, and nothing has really changed despite so-called legislation to cap that, whether it's in the EU or elsewhere. These bonuses continue. It's business as usual as far as the top executives are concerned. Um, as I said in the lecture yesterday, the culture of these top executives and traders has not changed one iota. This week, the annual figures for Wall Street bank bonuses were announced. We are, they are happy to announce to us that bonuses are right back to where they were before the crisis started again. And uh, this is great news because it means that the banks in, in the US are healthy and the people who are running them are even healthier. Uh, in, the, in Britain, we also had an announcement that bank bonuses are racing ahead. And even the nationalized banks, we, because we the state has put a load of our taxpayers' money in and run up debt into two of the biggest banks. Nothing has been done about capping their bonuses. No real control. They continue to hit new levels of expansion. Even more grotesque and horrible was the news that our only cooperative bank, which is called the Co-op Bank in the UK, part of the wide historical movement of the cooperative movement in the UK, which is many places where cooperative enterprises began, which has a range of cooperative enterprises over the period of 150 years in funerals, in pharmacies, in uh, supermarkets, and in banks. It has a cooperative bank. This cooperative group has been brought to its knees. It is bust, according to the news this morning, the investigator into the co-op bank as a, uh, an independent investigator, Lord Myers, Myers, who knows all about the city because he is one, he's investigated and says the co-op bank is bust. The co-op group is bust. The cooperative movement after 150 years is being decimated. Why? Because the co-op bank, and in its good wisdom of its board of executives, also paid quite nicely indeed, led by a chairman 
who was a drug addict, was a, a partaker of prostitution, who knew nothing about banks, but somehow got become chairman of the co-op group. He and his executives invested in buying up another mortgage lender, which had a load of toxic assets. They just bought the whole lot. They bought, they bought the worst supermarket chain in the UK that had made losses for years, bought that up. Why? Because they had the grand idea that they were going to expand into a great capitalist enterprise rather than the cooperative movement. They have destroyed in this crisis the cooperative movement. One of the issues that Marco raises in the question is how do we deal with the cooperative movement? Well, for a start, we're going to have to start again in the UK because this organisation has been crushed. So, banking for the public good, for social need, doesn't exist. And that's the simple print proposal that we have to deal with in the minds of uh, when we're presenting this to people who would recognize that that makes sense, that banking should be a public service. But how do we achieve that? It means public ownership, democratic control, and accountability. It means the election of those board officials. And as Marcus says in the first point, it also means we've got to end the situation where huge amounts of salaries and bonuses are wrapped up by these executives, completely unaccountable to anybody but shareholders. But shareholders are just other banks on the whole, or bondholders, have no real influence, or pension fund people who pay no attention to this. Uh, so we, we need to have some control of that. And he raised the point that um, uh, how do we do that? I mean, should they not, should we take, uh, ensure that they're, they're, if they do things wrong, that some, we can take money out of their personal assets and so on? Well, I'm not sure we need to do that, but what I would say is that uh, just like any other sector of the public sector, service, public employees, was, uh, this may be because I'm an old person, but I remember when I was in my 20s, the public sector was regarded, you went into and got a job in the public sector because you thought you were going to do a public service. You didn't, you expected a job, you, were going to say, you didn't expect a bonus on performance, and then a bonus on a bonus because you... Uh, and then a, a handshake if you got it wrong, uh, because that's what happens in banks. You get a golden handshake to go in, and you get a handshake to leave when you've ruined it. Uh, uh, it was a public service. You get a public salary, which is reasonable for the work you've done. So uh, I think that's the obvious thing that we can pose uh, this discussion. Uh, Marco points out that uh, we have to take over the major banks. And that personal everybody that will tell us later that in many ways we've already have a range of banks which are already publicly owned. And the Arcos proposes, I believe, that uh, at least what we want are banks which do the retail work, so taking people's deposits, a bit like downstairs with the Trade Union Savings Bank, and provide loans and facilities for individuals and in small companies. And we also need banks which look to play a role in the economy as a whole, as an investment. Uh, if you like, lead that the credit for the part of the whole program for investing in an economy and making it grow. That's what banks' jobs are, not to speculate on world markets, but provide the credit and support, the redistribution of available national savings and other resources in, into providing the funds by which a, a national investment plan, or for that matter, a year pan European investment plan can be applied. So, <clears throat> again, that is an area where public needs required. Um, and, that, and the reason I mention pan-European pan is because uh, Marcus makes the point that we have smaller economies, and that, in, as we discussed earlier, they either uh, don't have any sort of public banking in the sense of cooperatives, or their banking is controlled by foreign parent banks. So that we have a, an issue here about, if we talk about public ownership of the banks, I don't know if you say Bulgaria, which is why I think is about 95% foreign owned, or you take the Baltic states we were talking about earlier, which is more or less 100% foreign owned. But we, how do we do that if these parent banks are in Sweden, or they're in Austria, or in Italy, and so on? Uh, I, I don't think it's a significant problem. Um, in the UK, we have big five banks. What are they? They're Barclays, which is officially a British bank, HSBC, which isn't, is supposed to be a British bank, but it isn't really. It's sent, it's an international bank with, and it takes its money to, to Hong Kong if it wants to and brings it back accordingly. We have Santander, which has now got a big share of the British market, which is a Spanish bank. Um, and then we have Lloyd's, which is a British bank, 
I can't remember the last one, Mick. Uh, RBS. RBS. Yes, the Scottish Bank, which we may lose. Uh, so, but uh, <coughs> these banks, they have quite a lot of foreign equity investment, especially from Arabs in the case of Bar Barclays would have gone underground in the crisis if it hadn't been bailed out by, we now know, secret placements from uh, Arab banks and the, uh, Saudi Arabia and so on to keep that going. It seems to me that if these operations say, oh, well, we're going to move our headquarters to uh, Switzerland, Hong Kong, we can st there's no reason physically why the operations of that bank should not come under a state bank, even if it means the breakup of Santander's. They lose their British possessions. That's already happened in some cases in Latin America. Uh, they lose their British assets, uh, and what used to be a British asset, a separate British bank, will return to the state sector. I don't think it's a problem. Of course, it's a problem politically. It's not a problem economically, whether that can uh, be carried out. Um, also, the question of profit-making. Now, uh, Mark raises the point, well, if banks are going to be public services, what's the, what's the drive of efficiency? When the banks become inefficient, and I think that's an issue which is obviously raised by perhaps where you do generally have state banks, maybe that's the case in Slovenia, maybe, and other state utilities where uh, the people recognize, as it were, a certain inefficiency in these state organizations that they're bloated with staff, is the usual argument, that uh, they're, you queue forever, nobody cares about customer service. All those sort of arguments are presented. What we need is a nice, lean, efficient private bank that whips in there with a nice bit of advertising campaign and always says, have a good day, sir, after you, they've given you the money. That sort of customer service is what we need, that efficiency. Uh, they're way behind on the technology, to be more serious. Are they? They're state banks. They're not going into uh, the technology that provides the online service and so on. All the rest of it. Well, there's no particular reason why a profit market would make that any better. And, and, and uh, it seems to me that it's perfectly, it's reasonable to expect we, we can expect that the banks should perhaps, you know, the, the, under the plan, banks will be set some sort of return target. I'm not talking about individuals, that the banks will be set a return target, which would fit in with the allocation of savings and investment at a national level. If we say we don't want the banks to earn a profit at all, we're making a decision perhaps on the grounds that we don't want to redistribute money back to the government in the form of a dividend that we'll use in another area. We're actually trying to reduce the... Uh, um, and to stimulate uh, the cheapest possible lending to invest to investment by the real sector and the households, maybe we change that in a different year if we want to reduce that a bit and change the increase the return level so it comes back to the government in the form of a saving. These are decisions made politically by a democratically accountable operation that require a profit motive. It seems to me to achieve that. Um, and. The question of other sorts of, are we just going to have everything state bank owned? What happens, what about cooperative banks, which I've discussed earlier? I see absolutely no reason why cooperative operations or credit unions at local level should not operate alongside the banks at a national level that are state owned or at a pan-European level. In fact, that would be a good development. Uh, if you wanted to uh, set up a bank, say as a community, because it may form a credit union, or maybe a farmer's bank, if that's the sort of area you know, but some big specialization on cooperative basis. I don't see any reason why that could not be fitted in and regulated within uh, a, a predominantly state-owned and um, democratically accountable banking system. Indeed, um, in the UK, I don't think it applies to other countries, we have, we have so deregulated that you can set up banks. There's individuals have gone along and said, well, in small towns. I like to set up a bank because they have to go through all the bank regulation process. They've even opened up a few banks in shops uh, and, and tried to get deposits and carry out normal banking procedure. And in fact, we've also had people, very rich combines coming in trying to get a share of the market. Mainly this fails because the oligopoly of the big five is so great that these, these operations get crushed. In a state-based banking system, democratically controlled, it would be encouraged that people could operate cooperative banks or credit unions under reasonable degrees of regulation and control so that they, they don't become uh, fiefdoms for individuals to exploit. Um, is it dangerous, says Marco, um, for us to open up the books of the banks 
to see what's going on, discuss the issues and so on, uh, when there might be banking secrecy. So if they find, maybe their depositors would take their money to another country if they see the books and decide it doesn't look too good. Well, I suppose that's a possibility. It seems to me that it's much better to have a more accountable system, transparent, that's clear to the people what's involved, so they can sort it out, uh, even if it poses a question for certain private depositors as a result. It's the same thing applies to the question of further down that Margaret talks about. Is Michael Roberts opposed to regulation? Is he opposed to breaking up the banks? Is he opposed to financial transaction tax? And it's only got to be public ownership or nothing. Well, I think the answer is that you probably need some of those measures of regulation as well. You'll, there's no reason why we couldn't uh, tax banks on a European-wide scale in the terms of their financial attractions, particularly if they're engaged in risk-taking transactions. Uh, where there might be a world case for taxation. And, and the, the, some sort of capital controls and measures of regulation seem necessary, whatever the bank is, small or large. So I don't think the two things are contradictory. Uh, and it, on that basis, you can, you can develop a system which provides both um, the basis of a public-owned system, which provides the basic retail and commercial banking services that people want, plus operates within the national plan for investment and growth, so it's a development, has a development function as well, alongside of which you can have smaller banks, cooperatives, credit unions, other operations, which uh, would have to be regulated so they don't get out, uh, don't run out on their own and do what they want. Um, and in that way, you can provide a service to the population which makes banks successful in the interest of social need, not the interest of profit, and avoid crises which bring down the rest of the economy as well. Now, the last point that Marco makes, which is very important, I'm not quite even though I know the answers to this, because he says, um, can a socialized banking system function without a lender of last resort? What is, I, think, I take that to mean that, um, can we have a banking system, and do we still need a central bank which provides funds to liquefy the banking system, and if anything gets in trouble, also perhaps it, uh, it, it's, it, 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 it can provide funds by printing money, because the state can print money, it can provide extra credit out of nothing for a period of time, uh, in order to shore up any banks that get into trouble. Do we still need that function? Because that's the function of the central banks nationally, and in the case of the Eurozone, it's the function of the ECB. So do we need an ECB in a socialised banking system? Do we need a national central bank in a socialised banking system? I think my answer is, I'd like to hear what other people think, is that um, not necessarily. It's, there's no reason why the state itself directly through the treasury could not operate a fiscal injection to provide funds to, bank, to shore up a bank that gets into trouble. Uh, there is no reason why the state, through the Treasury, could not set the interest rate if that's required for basic first primary lending from the banks into the uh, real economy. I'm not sure. You, you might say that you have to have this central banking process. I'm not convinced because uh, you know it's not been in the history of capitalism that you've always had central banks. They've, they, they're, in, they're inventions of the last 20th century. Uh, supposedly to regulate the banking system because they had so many crashes and that presumably you needed this lender of last resort. Hasn't that worked very well in uh, avoiding such crashes? So I'm not sure what its role is. The other thing I would say about it is what I find a little bit grotesque about central banks is that apparently the thing that we have at the moment is that central banks should be completely independent from any democratic or government control. They should be they're super experts. Mario Draghi is sitting up there in his throne, untouched by Angela Merkel's complaints, or by uh, Monsieur, uh, whatever, or Senor, whoever it is in Italy. We're never quite sure. It's Renzi at the moment, sorry. Uh, or the uh, a delegation of peripheral government prime ministers coming along and saying, please keep the interest rate down. No, no, he's going to decide purely clearly and logically just on what is the right rate, what is the right amount to liquefy the economy in the interests of the whole economy. He and his board and his 
100,000 economists sitting down there in Frankfurt on uh, tax-free salaries, um, deciding exactly how we should set this uh, uh, European economy. Is that really the most democratic way of organising the monetary system uh, through the state? Isn't there a... Why can't a democratically accountable uh, ECB exist if we're going to have one? Why should not the board of the ECB elected through direct election. I mean, I was thinking the other day, we've got the Euro elections coming up. Now, why can't we have elections for the ECB board as part of the European Parliament? Why can't we have the Slovenian Central Bank board elected during the Slovenian parliamentary elections? That should raise a few eyebrows amongst the politicians if individuals can stand for this Slovenian Central Bank Board and also uh, decide who is going to be the governor of the Central Bank. Um, uh, why should it be separated off? This is a new idea that it should be independent. The finance sector should not be subject to control by the politicians because it's too serious a matter for capitalism to allow politicians to interfere with it. Uh, that, that is the reversal of what should be the reality, isn't it? Uh, what should be the right thing for public needs. So <coughs> the question of whether we have a lender for last resort and the question of how that is accountable to the electorate is something that we perhaps ought to thrash out in assembly. Thank you. Uh, before I give the word to, 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 to Philip, I will just um, uh, explain something about uh, the text that Michael was referring to. Uh, it is a text in, uh, uh, with, uh, entitled uh, uh, Points of Discussion. And it is a sort of a summary of uh, the papers which I was able to read before the conference uh, by, by Dimitris, by, by Philip, by, by, by Michael, and by, by me. So, um, uh, and we will come to that uh, uh, text uh, at the end of this session because it helps us, I, I, I think, to uh, structure our debate. A little more, but Philip's uh, Philip's uh, talk will will also um, be um, I, I understand in line with these points because the points were made uh, uh, in relation to, to uh, also to his text. So, uh, please. Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, for for the invitation, and secondly, to speak on this particular issue. <coughs> Actually. Um, it's good to come back to something like that because actually it was a paper we did in 2010 when uh, there was uh, more, at least in the German situation, more discussion underway of how solving a banking crisis by now. Sadly, a lot of decision has been made which I think would not necessarily be the right one, but still uh, in even better, even if we haven't sufficiently yet fixed the German banking system, so it perhaps be even better if the paper can help to fix other countries' financial sectors. <coughs> okay, so of course it is very much um, oriented on the on the situation in Germany. I will expand a little bit on what is the banking structure there and of course uh, our proposal fits to that, but I think we can afterwards in the discussion also see how it can be adapted to the Slovenian case. So, what is first of all the situation in Germany? Um, we have, different from uh, many other European countries, a very diversified and highly competitive uh, banking sector with three pillars. Uh, on the one hand, you have so called public law banks, which is öffentlich uh, rechtliche Bank. I got to just drop the, the German words because you will probably sometimes come across the German wording in some articles. Um, I will explain a little bit more what, what that actually encompasses. Uh, secondly, there is a pillar of cooperative banks. And thirdly, that uh, is a pillar that we are mainly talking about or that we are typically used to. It's uh, the typically uh, multinational, huge, privately um, stock market based private bank. So first of all, what is these um, public law banks? It's, um, it um, entails two uh, layers, so to say. 
on the one hand, you have so-called local Sparkassen, which are <coughs> independent local banks owned by the municipality and also controlled by them. So the, there are people from the local communities, from, from the uh, city's parliaments um, on, the, on the board uh, or on the, um, on the various control panels. And um, they have a, in their own constituency and in their foundation, they have committed themselves to have some kind of a, a common goal orientation. Um, they only do business on the level of that municipality, on that territory where they exist. So all of these 40, 30, uh, 40, uh, 430 um, Sparkassen um, do not compete with each other, but they are in different locations, so to say. Um, and uh, what they mainly do is um, providing finance to private customers, as well as to medium and small size um, businesses. Um, the second layer is the so-called Landesbanken. You've perhaps come across this term. Um, they were originally formed as banks for the regional governments or even longer by, way back to, um, to German regional authorities and, um, and kings and whatever in some two, 200 years back um, and have turned more and more from this government-oriented service uh, orientation towards uh, basically conventional commercial banking um, which is partly um, a result of um, the I mean they are part of the uh, network with these Sparkassen so that means the Sparkassen are doing the business on the local level whereas the Landesbanken are um, channeling joint um, activities like for example uh, IT services things that certainly not a individual local branch of a bank can do um, and to organize it in a in a federation of banks but more and more they have become uh, players themselves um, they are also mainly publicly owned at least uh, historically they were some of them were partly sold out um, and um, actually, I would say it was also due to the politician that they were let out into the financial market activities. So they got like benchmarks on how much uh, rate of return they should deliver and whatever else you're going to do, it doesn't interest. And um, <coughs> so what they, m I mean, the Sparkas, of course, come to some level or to, to some limits when it comes to, you know, giving a, um, uh, 500 million uh, euro credit to Volkswagen in uh, in the state of uh, Lower Saxony, for example. Then you would not probably only go to the to the local Sparkasse, but then you would also approach um, your Landesbank in that area. And so far, they have some some important function also to deliver uh, loans for bigger companies and to uh, yeah to organize some services which go beyond um, uh, a local Sparkasse. But um, what they actually did was going more and more involved in, in international capital markets. And there was a yeah, kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy because um, as growing um, in the commercial banking sector, the private banks were, of course, afraid of them or wanted to, to get them out of their market. So what they did was going to the European Commission, telling them, oh, these are state-owned banks, and therefore they have some implicit guarantee, so you must make them not being able to benefit on this state guarantee. And therefore, the Commission uh, and um, the European institutions finally sentenced that um, this um, guarantee scheme of the state or the, the regional government for their bank must not longer exist. Uh, but of course, uh, in a, well, 
period of time of three, four, five years, this had to be melted down. And what they did was, of course, using these three, four, five years to sum up and attract any money at the still guaranteed costs, uh, which were effectively lower than the commercial banks, that they got on the markets. So they got huge, uh, they took up huge credit on the international capital market uh, because it was still cheap and they, of course, expected it to be uh, more expensive after these guarantees uh, would not be allowed to provide it. But they had no idea what to do with the money. <coughs> so what did they do? They basically put it all in special investment purposes in Ireland. <laughs> um, which, to be honest, was not a very clever idea. Um, it was, I mean, they had actually no clue about the business they were doing. That was a big problem. I mean, you can argue with bankers um, that they are good or bad, but uh, the first important thing is do they know what they are doing? And normally, um, the, the people on the board don't know all the details. But even if you find out that the, the people in charge of a particular project don't know what they are doing, then you should really be starting being very careful. And so that was very much the case with these London Spanker. Um, they have piled up huge stocks in, in, um, also in the US. I mean, uh, I think like 30 or 35 percent of all these CDOs, these collateralized debt obligations stemming from the subprime crisis in the US ended up with German London's banks, um, which is an extremely high proportion compared to their share in other parts of the market, because they were simply just completely stupid. Yeah, made in Germany, so to say. <laughs> um, and there were even a lot of hints that what they're doing was not very reasonable, so you had talks with the, uh, with the U.S. financial authorities for supervising, telling us, well, they kept uh, asking Westdeutsche, uh, West LB, for example, oh, why the hell are you buying all these real estates around the corner where everybody else in the U.S. <laughs> is retreating from that area? So must there be some magic argument? Do you have a particular clue why to do that? Um, but also the German authorities didn't care about it. And so, yeah, we ended with <coughs> huge losses on these Landesbanken, whereas these Sparkassen were, as locally rooted, really core of the, yeah, keeping up the financial uh, backbone for German industry, for medium and small sized uh, enterprise. So there was not a credit crunch as known in basically all other European countries in 2008. And that was, to our understanding, mainly uh, the reason because these Sparkassen themselves were not involved in that market altogether. They, they could just go on, and so they did. So let's come to the cooperative banks. Um, yeah, they have a similar um, two-layer system. You have the local, even smaller than Sparkassen often, uh, local branches, local um, Reif Eisenbanken and Volksbanken. Um, Reif Eisen, I think, is also busy here in, in Slovenia, but it's as normally at home they are, you know, a tiny, nice little, <coughs> smallest, beautiful banks. And then they, if they don't know what to do with their money, they send somebody abroad to set up a giant bank with the same name and do bullshit. <laughs> this is happening quite, uh, quite often, which is very sad. So. We also have that in Germany, for example, with Targo Bank, a cooperative bank in France, which is doing basically credit uh, cards, cre credit um, services in Germany, with a completely different business model. Uh, but it's uh, in, in, in France, they are the good guys, but in Germany, they are not. So it's a bit difficult then to talk about uh, this with the French friends, um, whether to nationalize them or not. Anyway, so. Um, so they do a very similar model, a uh, similar business model like the Sparkassen, but they are yeah, cooperatively owned, but also in the same sense of having their territory on where they do the business on, and not interfering with the other. As you see, um, in 2011, it was 1,120 independent um, cooperative local banks. And yeah, as, a, as an umbrella, uh, over this network, there um, 
are two also major banks similar to the Landesbank, but not as much involved in the international capital market. They are doing that too, but not so intensively. They are more working as clearance houses and um, partly also investing some excess deposits in, in some of the uh, local branches um, um, and redistributing in the, in the network or putting it on the international capital market. So, and now let's go for the private banks. Um, <coughs> so we have basically three major commercial banks in Germany. This is Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank and Übervereinsbank, which is part of Unicredit. Um, they have, we could say, in, in the overall market share, uh, each of the three pillars has, yeah, <coughs> in private banking, the, I mean, in, in, in retail banking to, to private customers, the private banks are fairly weaker than the Sparkassen and the, and the cooperative banks, so like 50 or 40, 40 to 20 percent. The <coughs> Private banks are mainly busy in major cities, but whenever you come to the to the countryside, you will probably only find uh, a cooperative bank or a Sparkas, and even they have started to, we are not really um, <coughs> to deal with each other who's going to stay where, but in some areas where there are just a couple of people left, it's sometimes even not worth having two of them, so one could discuss that. Um, beyond these three huge multinational banks, we have approximately 100 specialized regional banks um, in real estate financing, in uh, bond markets, in uh, financing of, uh, <coughs> of car leasing, etc., things like that. And uh, another 100 branches of foreign banks, which are comparably smaller, but still on the making, getting a higher share every year in the retail sector at least. Um, and well, another private bank is for where very wealthy individuals, which probably are everywhere, but you don't hear about them very often, and if they just <coughs> hit the rock, uh, sometimes you don't hear about them either. So, what do we want to do about this system? Our idea is, as I already, I think, partly explained, um, a system so complex as it is today cannot be democratically controlled in any respect. Even not controlled in a sense of a <coughs> proper business plan for a bank itself, as many banks have proven that they hardly had no chance what asset they actually had on their balance sheet and how they worked and what happened to a CEO if we turn this wheel or have that cascade a little different. Um, so, generally speaking, the complexity of today's financial system mainly serves some very specialized interest in that, um, in that industry and also with a lot of wealthy individuals who get some very clear cuts uh, special solutions for themselves, but for the majority of people it actually doesn't benefit. And even for the majority of businesses, uh, it is not of such an extraordinary benefit that it um, accrues to the cost that it can cause if something goes wrong. Therefore we would say let's reduce and also thereby resize the whole banking sector to some core functions to some core businesses and this is basically the three folds. This is payments, this is um, offering secure and simply understandable savings instruments and this is the provision of loans for private and public investment. Um, if you take the abbreviation we told uh, uh, it to be PSL. Yeah. So if you're going to go for a PSL uh, business model, then this is fairly close to what the Sparkassen and the local um, cooperative banks are now doing, but very far away 
from uh, what's happening in the international capital markets and what banks are doing there. <coughs> so the question is how do we get there if you want to get there? Um, I'm not sure whether it would exactly work the same as like three years back because some of the private banks have partly recovered by public money, partly. But the idea was actually in 2009, 2010, almost all major banks, public, private, as well as cooperative, were bankrupt. <coughs> if you would make a proper opening and reading of the books. Of course, with the accounting standards, you have a long time scales to um, reschedule, to see how assets are going to re revalue, etc. But um, if we make a proper uh, analysis of the, the balance sheets, probably all the big banks, uh, at least in the second time, you know, if Commerzbank falls, then Deutsche Bank is also very much in trouble. Then. Um, just by making a proper uh, stress test, so to say, um, of the balance sheets, we would have simply had uh, all of the internationally active banks in trouble and um, under need for recapitalization. And in this case, of course, the, t the state can choose, on the one hand, what he thinks needs to be recapitalized uh, in terms of uh, systemic uh, importance, because you want to prevent some uh, series of bankruptcies. And on the other hand, of course, what kind of a business model of a well international or national major bank I want to um, support and which other I just set to, into bankruptcy. And um, so the idea would be if the bank are forced to write down all their incurred losses, then um, we're very easily, uh, as a state, very much um, considered in the national um, arena. Um, we would have let in the, the major private banks, as far as possible, just going bankrupt and um, making with bridge banks or bad banks some kind of a, a way to prevent systemic um, collapse. But um, if that is not possible, of course, we, we need to offer some recapitalization to some of the major banks. But still, at the end, it's all publicly owned. The already publicly owned get a recapitalization and stay publicly, and the others are just squeezed out, squeezed out with, the, with the old um, shareholders. So what will be the consequence of that um, for the credit unions and also the the Sparkassen, hardly anything would change. Um, the Landesbanken would need a proper recapitalization. And as I said, the majority of private banks would disappear into insolvency or become also public by the recapitalization. And then in the next step, we would try to, to group what is left over in that situation <coughs> to a local and, uh, well, regional or state level, which means um, we have the, the Sparkassen uh, staying on the re uh, local level and the Landesbanken and the parts of uh, some of the former private banks who do some also proper business in lending to big companies, etc., would be merged with the Landesbanken, ret uh, retreated from the capital market, from the investment banking sector, and basically doing uh, loan services to bigger companies, to regional governments, to the federal government, etc. Um, what remains is this two-tier system. We have a municipality and cooperative, uh, cooperatively owned credit unions for individual clients and small and medium-sized enterprises. And we had a regional or sub-national level uh, credit unions or Sparkassen-like uh, regional institutions owned by local um, credit unions as a network or by uh, the state and uh, the local Sparkassen on the other hand. So we had basically two of the three pillars would survive the system um, and we have also competition between the two of them. 
I think this is quite important um, because, of course, when you ever come with nationalization, uh, immediately it comes up with, uh, you know, with, uh, without any competi competition, you end up with, you know, queuing forever, you've mentioned that. And I think this is also a good argument to confront that because if you have uh, cooperative banks and public law banks on the local level competing with each other, I think that's um, enough of a competition to make sure that the clients are finally well served. Um, this would be so far the step of nationalization, but nationalization is um, perhaps a um, condition or a precondition, but certainly not a sufficient condition for socialization. Because as we have seen, the Landesbank and were nationalized banks, but it didn't prevent them from doing just stupid or the worst stupid things and ca causing a lot of costs to the taxpayers too. So that means we have to um, install this common ground orientation for all these uh, banking uh, layers um, and we would have to further democratize the supervisory boards of these um, banks. Um, by now already there are representatives of the local citizenship in the Sparkassen, for example, but it's mainly the parties in the local parliament who decide who's going to be in there. So by that means, we as the Linka are also, um, particularly in East Germany, basically in all of the Sparkassen. But um, to be honest, um, I don't, I cannot tell you by being there on the supervisory board, we would prevent anything bad from happening. Yeah? <coughs> Uh, it's just uh, an issue of resources, so if you want to take public control and democratic uh, scrutiny somewhat serious, you cannot just sit there somebody who is of goodwill and has every two months the evening of two and a half hours just to get a short input by the branch manager being told where you spend how many loans to what firms. <coughs> so uh, it needs a little bit more. And that also means you have to, of course, um, discuss in the public um, whether you do that um, on a, well, are there more people who do that on a voluntary basis or having volunteers but then have professional support from lawyers, from, um, from accountants, from other people who can really judge something. And then it's also about secrecy, of course. Uh, many of these documents that you get uh, on the balance <coughs> are normally uh, <coughs> confidential and restricted and then uh, even being part of a supervisory board you can basically not prove them right or wrong because you cannot talk with anybody about it. Uh, some of the Sparkassen send it to you at home so you can go somewhere but others really say well on the evening before the, before the supervisory board meets there is the book open for two hours in the business time from four to six in the evening. And if you haven't shown up there, you haven't seen the books, and that's your problem. So this is certainly not the way how you're going to deal with um, a proper look into the, <coughs> into the books by a um, supervisory body. But I think this can be done. There are ways to do that, and particularly when you shrink the available financial instruments to a level that people can understand them. I think for a regional or subnational bank there would be still a different level um, of knowledge necessary than, than to a local Sparkasse or Volksbank. But still with some experience I think it can be done. And of course what I think too is we would need to expand uh, the, the sh uh, stakeholders who are part of that uh, supervisory bodies. The, the workers in the banks are so far part of that, but they are, to be honest, not on the forefront of uh, making public some scandalous development in the bank, <coughs> because they are basically part of that. So, I mean, it's very important for the working conditions in the bank to have them aboard, but um, I don't believe actually they are necessarily the best um, instance in terms of the public interest in that respect. It's for a logical reason, we cannot expect them that to be, and so somebody else needs to be in um, be in authority of that. So, um, yeah, this um, comes to um, mainly to the end. 
um, where it means, of course, such a situ uh, or such a trajectory to um, to socialization would, of course, have to be accompanied by strong regulation. Even Sparkassen and local Volksbanken were pretty bad in, uh, you know, selling Lehman certificates to their clients. Not all, not widespread, not everywhere, but some did. And of course, uh, so this has to be confronted. We need uh, a very clear cut um, set of, <coughs> of indicators of what kind of instruments would be still allowed at all. And then for what kind of customer. I mean, if I'm uh, working with a medium-sized enterprise with 500 people working there and two full-time accountants, I can talk with them about some financial instruments in a different way than to my grandma. Uh, but still, the, I would say like 70% of the complexity of today's financial markets would just be ruled out by this, what we have called a finance tuff. That was this what I, uh, at the beginning, explained to say, not everything that is not uh, forbidden is allowed, but everything on the market needs a special registration and admission um, and only if if we have turned around the whole system that way we have also a chance that uh, in these banks the the instruments that are offered can be much easily be understood and also the responsibilities if something goes wrong are much easier to um, to identify yeah and this is just a list of some of the regulatory uh, improvement that we would uh, certainly met for that in terms of capital requirements, of course, it's a two-side story. Um, if we expect them to have like 50% um, <coughs> core capital, then this might affect a little bit our medium and small um, enterprises because it will just shrink the, the capacity of um, awarding loans. Because our local municipalities at the moment are very much bankrupt, um, and so they are not going to put new capital in these banks. So I think we would need some trajectory to come some higher capital requirements, but um, I would something expect between 15 and 20 percent <coughs> or something, but not going higher probably. Of course, we have to talk about the remuneration of managers in the banking sector um, and about their liability, how far they have also to um, pay off with uh, private wealth if something goes wrong. Um, yeah, the financial transaction tax is in <coughs> itself also, a, I think, important break on some financial instruments because they are simply not profitable anymore um, in terms of the amount of turnovers you have there. Um, yeah, this new agency for approving finance instruments is this finance turf that I mentioned that you really register and allow financial instruments to come on the market at all. And if they have no registration, you are not allowed to offer them to anybody. <coughs> um, well, the rating agency will also be part of the regulation frame. We are certainly not very lucky with what Moody's, Standard & Poor's, etc. did. But it's still a problem, I have to admit. Um, just giving that to uh, classical state agency, on the other hand, is certainly not the only solution. So what I could rather admit, uh, our experience is that the Sparkassen today are sufficiently away <coughs> from the state to have their own mind. So rather to have some rating agencies in that respect uh, with, well, concerning uh, commercial papers, things like that, but uh, of course they cannot rate themselves as, as bad, so we do not have a proper solution to that problem here. Um, we do <coughs> think it still needs central banks <laughs> in this respect, um, but they would need more and more targeted instruments, particularly if we're talking about <coughs> the Eurozone and the currency union. Um, of course, Greece and Spain needs different interest rates now than Germany does. But we have no way to deliver. But there could be. Um, what we have suggested is some, normally you have some minimum requirements. Um, what was it in English? I think it's minimum requirements, is it? 
yeah. how, how much you have to uh, deposit for the deposits that you have on your balance sheet. Yeah. But you could also do the same, not just from, from the liability, but from the, um, <coughs> from the asset side of your balance sheet. You could say, for real estate credit in Spain, it needs a different level of deposits at a central bank or a different um, rate of um, uh, central bank credit than you do for other areas of production. Of course, there will be ways to sideline that. But uh, if you say so, then that means there is no way to steer anything because all the time there are some ways to sideline it. But even if you have a commitment to say there are problems in the currency union which need some special treatment of different regions and areas, then I think uh, we should make concrete ideas of what to come up with because otherwise I see no chance to really go on with the Eurozone as a, in some long-term future, a prosperity area. Um, yeah, the <laughs> financial supervision is also a topic in itself. Um, we are on the board of the German, I mean, on the supervisory board of the German um, supervisory authority, and um, well, there's a lot of room for improvement, I would say. Um, and to some degree, it would be actually solved by just reducing the, the complexity of the system because nobody in the authorities can actually deal with that complexity. If even the banks can't, how you can expect that? from the supervisory authorities, um, but still also there are some yeah, in ways of incentives or how you strengthen the, legally the, the power of, um, of the authorities against banks is quite important and can be done. Um, and the latest point, uh, yeah, well, this is a bit cross cutting to, to everything. Whatever should be de democratically controlled needs some level of democratic knowledge. This is also why uh, I would not say that a, a referendum in the Ukraine is per se bad, but you cannot do this within, within one week without having any space and time and a public discussion of what's going on. Yeah? And so ill-informed democracy is no democracy, and particularly when it comes to controlling financial institutions, you must have um, also in the in the majority of normal people, some basic understanding of, of what is going on. So they must be able to differentiate a share from a bond and things like that. And um, so this is also certainly a challenge, but it can be met, so to say. Okay, there we are. I would like to thank both of our uh, speakers and I will now open uh, the debate and I warn you if you don't uh, <coughs> um, if you have no questions and comments then I will proceed with my <laughs> points of discussion so you have a choice something like that. yeah yeah just a small uh, question. Uh, actually, uh, my concern uh, is maybe line of, of inquiry with uh, this line of inquiry with uh, his uh, question whether a public uh, banking system would require a lender of last resort, and uh, we have been focused so much on the institutional forms so far. And, and perhaps the answer lies in this thing that you mentioned, in the complexity of the system. So before uh, we can say that this institutional form is something that is um, uh, that, that will work within some kind of social strategy, perhaps perhaps we need to discuss um, you know, the hierarchy of money. Uh, that is, the, the different forms of financial assets that are now. Uh, circulating uh, financial markets. And in, in that sense, you mentioned that um, the first requirement would be to kind of uh, reduce the complexity of financial markets. And I, I think that that would uh, uh, require that some kind of financial instruments, some structural financial instruments, would have to be banned. I mean, outright banned. And, uh, and that, uh, I think, brings us to um, 
basically political challenge because we know from financial history, basically, uh, we can recall 1990s and, and uh, uh, Brooks Lee Bourne being the head of uh, CFTC, trying to not ban, but look into the OTC derivative markets, and she was kind of uh, you know, pushed away, and, 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 she, and, and, and yet it, 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 uh, she, she had to resign. My, my point here, here is that, um, yeah, so but do, do you agree that you know, some financial products really need to be uh, uh, declared illegal? And um, uh, in, in, in your view, why is this question, this is my opinion, why is this question uh, of, of, uh, of the difference between uh, various financial products and, uh, and their influence on financial markets and generally on economic outcomes, why is this so low on European left political agenda? Why, 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 is this, why there isn't so much more discussion on this? Uh, because it, is, it seems to me that any kind of sensible reform effort starts from there, right? First you have to kind of choose you know, what type of financial instruments are allowed, what, what type are forbidden, mm -hmm. and then you can proceed to developing various institutional forms. Because if you have state-owned banks and they you know, move into this type of activities like, like uh, 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 German Landesbank, right? Uh, then it makes no difference in the end, right? <laughs> Uh, ah, Sasha? I have uh, basically two questions uh, for Philip, and I don't mind if uh, Michael would also uh, comment. Uh, so, the first um, question uh, refers to your basically suggestion to uh, uncover the balance sheets uh, of the banks to basically uh, 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 show uh, public uh, all the losses and uh, According to your uh, opinion, this would uh, basically result in uh, the fact that a lot of big commercial banks would uh, have to go into insolvency procedures. So, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, isn't that a rather uh, risky, uh, basically, proposal? I mean, I'm not uh, basically afraid of uh, banks uh, going uh, bankrupt in themselves, but nevertheless, we have a really interwined, uh, interconnected uh, economy where, uh, I know, say one, uh, if one bank goes uh, into bankruptcy, another bank will go into bankruptcy, uh, and then yeah. another enterprise will go into bankruptcy, and this will lead to uh, large uh, unemployment or stuff like that. So, uh, I mean, uh, what would be uh, your uh, additional, uh, uh, basically, uh, procedures to mitigate uh, such potential uh, outcomes? And uh, the second question is, uh, so uh, when you basically propose uh, decentralization of the banking system, uh, basically to kind of uh, reorganize uh, the whole uh, banking sector according to the model of these uh, Sparkassen and uh, cooperatives. Uh, I mean, the advantages of these banks are uh, rather clear, as you mentioned. I mean, they are embedded in their uh, local uh, environment. Uh, they, I mean, have uh, better options to actually. Um, uh, provide credit to small enterprises and to households and stuff like that, but uh, wouldn't, uh, say, uh, some kind of a socialized or socialist uh, democratically planned economy also basically meet big uh, infrastructure public investment. So uh, uh, how would this basically small uh, local firms uh, provide enough of loan capital to finance such, say, big uh, infrastructure project of, or public investment? Um, yeah, I just um, first of all, um, Mila, you are absolutely right. I mean, uh, I'm actually talking about banning a lot of the uh, instruments and business types that we have today. I cannot really exactly tell you. We were trying to count how many instruments are on the market, and then to say, well, we gotta ban 85.3 percent of them, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I would say like three quarters of the whole business is gone then, I would say. Perhaps even more, I mean, in terms of 
when it comes to derivatives, I mean, they amount and amount on top of each other and get uh, just hilarious sums. And this all would be probably very much be gone. Um, I would agree, of course, that um, in any banking collapse, there is the risk of some um, series of bankruptcies in, in the banking sector. But, uh, of course, we must be prepared then to recapitalize them from the state. And this is public money. And so we have to tell the public that it's going to cost money. The question is, what do we get for it? I mean, so at least we must be careful that we have some chance also to bail in some of the creditors when it comes down, so that we just make a big rescue package for all the private investors into the private banking sector. Of course not. But, of course, uh, nationalizing banks, uh, at least on the basis of our constitution, is normally not for free. Uh, it's a sad story. Normally you should do that when all of them are perfectly doing well, and then you can easily pay off uh, the money it costs by all the profits they're going to make. But now we are in the situation that the time of profits in that sector is... I mean, there are still some, but... Um, they are highly volatile now, and um, private banks are not the cash cow anymore that they used to be, at least from a German point of view. So I think we have to clearly admit that this is going to cost money, but if we leave it as it is now, with the private banking sector either being undercapitalized and therefore not lending to the, to the real economy, uh, then they are of no use and just only collecting some new financial instruments that we might have to pay off in a couple of years in the next crisis anyway. So I would say it's not for free, but it's perhaps the cheapest solution. And the idea is, of course, um, if we make it in terms of the accounting standards, that um, we squeeze out all the, pro, uh, the private um, owners by just declaring them to be bankrupt, at least that we do not have to pay them out but still we have to get in some new money. But the new money is at least worth some part of the balance sheet, whereas saving banks without um, bailing in and um, squeezing out the, the former uh, private owners is even more expensive. And um, yeah, when we made that suggestion in 2010, um, I mean, we know what is paid by now to rescue the banks and also particularly the lenders, lenders banks in the Com uh, Commerzbank in Germany. If we would have used that money for a plan like this, it might have been a little more costly, but then we would be now in control of the whole sector. And that is the, the important difference. Of course, it only makes sense if you have uh, an idea of what you want to do as a government with the banking sector. I mean, in so far, I come back to your question of do we not also need big banks to have a major development plan for the country? Um, we need a plan for an economic plan that should be supported by bank lending. And part of our problem um, of our uh, proposal is also to have like uh, cross cutting across the different regional um, Sparkassen. Um, some investment boards or planning councils that try to um, yeah, have some ideas of transformation. I mean, we are living in a deep, um, as well as uh, environmental, as particularly when it comes to climate change, as well as in terms of uh, energy, uh, uh, extremely demanding situation. We need huge investments in public infrastructure, in new technologies, etc. And all of this should, of course, be following by some kind of plan of, um, of some government. It must not be a, a 10 years plan in all the details, but certainly we see a clear role that banks should play in such a transformation of what we call a socio-ecological um, transformation into the future. From a pure economic point of view, of course, Germany is far better off than many other uh, countries in, in Europe. And this is perhaps also one of the arguments that can be used um, 
whenever other countries um, take account of why did Germany so good in the um, in the crisis, um, they finally find out it's these small and medium-sized enterprises which are at the same time internationally compatible. So how did that, that happen? And then what they normally find out, oh, they get financing. What the hell, how does that work? SMEs get financing? Uh, which I think, why not? So, and, um, so we have like inquiry commissions from UK coming to Germany, and I mean government commissions, yeah? Consulting with the German government whether it would be useful to set up a set of Sparkassen in the UK to reinvent local banking, to reinvent like a middle class enterprise environment, yeah? Uh, so the UK is not really well known for having no clue in banking, perhaps not in local banking, but this is the con conclusion that some of the countries actually took. And so I think there are also in Greece now underway a couple of ideas to, um, to have some local banking set up um, Together with uh, the Sparkassen have uh, their own foundation in which they are working with international experts and, and consult and advise and things like that. Um, so when it comes to such very concrete ideas to judge whether it would be possible or what are the legal prerequisites to set up something like that, um, the Sparkassen are actually very helpful themselves because they have an interest in spending or spreading the idea of such a type of banking also in other European countries, because otherwise the Commission simply don't understand what's going on, you know. This is such a pecu peculiar type of well-functioning system that in Brussels is still just treated like a strange animal, and therefore is also not uh, accommodated for in regulation. Um, of course, the, the Sparkas are politically quite strong, we should not undermine them. But they are always struggling to get their voice heard in, in Brussels when it comes to regulating issues because, of course, all the regulation is done for the stock market multinational banks and their normal ways to, to do business. And uh, that often does not benefit the, the Sparkassen because it does not fit to their, to their business model. Perhaps their Do we have another question? Yeah. Well, I have one question to remarks. Uh, first, uh, the question. Uh, what about uh, the European and about the KEV, the developed mm -hmm. bank? Because in Greece, we, and the Atsiris also, we were favored of this idea of a, a developed bank. And uh, all the others have to know that uh, KEV and uh, some other financial institutions are excluded from the Basel III or etc. Basel uh, rules mm -hmm. about uh, uh, demanding standards of capital adequacy. This is the first question. So also, about the remark, uh, for the ECB role and if we need uh, a central bank, in my personal view, yes, we need. But not such a central bank that we have in our days in Europe. Uh, this is something uh, unique in the central bank history. We have only the dimensional of uh, price stability. I remember the yeah. previous uh, president of ECB, Trisset, that in uh, 2008, when the recession was knocking at our door, mm -hmm. that he increased the rates because he was price stability, was the French, and so price stability. After, after uh, six months, he started to, to reduce it dramatically. But, of course, what kind of economist are you that you can see that in a few months the crisis is coming? Okay. Uh, also, uh, because Philip said before about that Greece and other countries need a different uh, level of rates, I think before we talk about this, uh, I think that we need to talk about the ECB guidance and the decision. For example, I have, and I can read it, uh, the collateral haircuts for Greece. 
marketable debt instruments issued or fully guaranteed by the Hellenic, Hellenic Republic. If you have a bond of a maturity of three years, there is a haircut of 33%. <laughs> if it's a zero coupon, the haircut is 35.0%. If you go to 10 years, the haircut is 56%. Mm -hmm. So if I, if as a state I issue a bond, for example, for infrastructure or for a utility state company, and I give to the bank and the bank to cover the asset side of the balance sheet, go to Mr. Draghi, said, okay, I give you back liquidity of 44%. So, at the same time, according to the Basel III rules, the risk weight of the uh, European member states are zero. So, at the same time, you do different decisions. From, from one hand, the haircuts, the collateral haircuts, and from the other hand, the risk weight is zero. Yeah. So, we have to decide what kind of ECB we really want. And, of course, we have to Look about the decision, what uh, they are doing for the all Euro member states. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And about the KFB. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, KFW is um, the abbreviation of Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, which is a development bank in Germany, uh, founded after the Second World War as an idea of reconstructing Germany. And it was it has a very strange or interesting um, um, background because um, you probably remember the London Debt Agreement of uh, 1953. That was when the money, uh, or partly um, some of the outstanding debts of Germany of post-war times were Marshall Plan money. So Marshall Plan money was credit, no, um, no benefits. Also. Well, benefits, no. yes, but, but not just payments. Yeah. So, um, and a lot of that was written off. Uh, but German um, enterprises were already doing so well before that that they had to pay in their principal and uh, and interest payments back on the Marshall Plan scheme on a particular account in our national bank um, when the debt then was cancelled in the London agreement that money was used as a forming capital for KfW um, which is quite important if you tell some of the German backgrounds you know where it's actually from it's basically from a very clever international debt regime that we have a KfW now which is not very comparable to the debt regime we have right now can be helpful. Not all of the members in the government know that. Um, and then it was a dramatic uh, success story, of course, in Germany itself to reconstruct it. And uh, KFW is active in subsidized, partly state guaranteed loans to medium and uh, also bigger enterprises, and a lot of, um, for example, loans to private people to. Um, uh, to renovate and uh, innovate their their private properties for reasons of um, saving on energy or for um, setting up alternative uh, energy um, facilities like you know uh, photovoltaic um, uh, facilities also part of at the very very beginning of the big uh, windmills were co-financed by KFW and it's now in terms of the balance sheet the third biggest bank in, in Germany. It's about 550 billion uh, on the asset sheet. And it's a major player, but it's not playing on the market. But whenever it comes to, you know, we need to do something about it, <laughs> it's an extremely big shadow budget for a government because it's double the size than its own budget. Um, and for example, when we had to um, rescue some of the banks, like um, what was it, EKB, for example, uh, the stupid guys from Düsseldorf, you remember? And um, yeah, so there comes KFV uh, 
W in and um, it's a very very important political tool to steer the economy um, and um, for that reason that it's not complete or hardly competing on the market because it has subsidized rates um, it is not under complete um, basal three uh, regulation there are some that uh, is accounting for it but not very much of it actually but um, it has of course also some difficulties with it, at least from our point of view. We are sitting in the supervisory council, but as uh, normally uh, you don't steer very much by that. And uh, it's also a very secret institution. So, um, I'm trying to, to find if it's in the hand of the good guys, it's a good thing, you know? And at the moment it's also, I think, huge, very serious and very um, proper, I would say, but Still, it needs a little bit more democratization to be part of our, you know, um, socialized bank sector, so to say. It, it's also, be, I don't know if you know it, uh, KFW is the official lender of Greece. Mm -hmm. According to the first uh, memorandum, the first yeah. agreement, we didn't uh, take money from German as a republic, let's say, but from KFW. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the, the financial uh, services, so to say, for the, for the federal government, also, on, uh, also in development uh, financing and so on for, for the countries in the south, etc. Uh, <coughs> well, if there are no other comments from the, from the audience, um, <coughs> then I will make a few. For a question, um, to put this uh, discussion maybe in a more broader uh, perspective. Now, uh, a couple of you, uh, I think Michael and uh, Philip as well, and Misla also, um, stated that um, about, okay, let's say 70% or so instruments, financial instruments used on the financial markets are in a way redundant. Now, uh, this is a thesis that we hear uh, a lot, especially in the left uh, academia, or not only on the left, uh, uh, it's uh, also a response of some, let's say, more conservative um, economists, not in political terms conservative, but conservative in a, in a way they would say, you know, uh, this is something, uh, some new invention that uh, cannot be understood. Let's keep it uh, in a traditional way. Uh, but anyhow, there is another current uh, in the, in the uh, theories of, of, the, of the modern contemporary capitalism, which would say that, uh, this, fun that this financialization thesis um, is wrong, and that uh, the economy has transformed in a way uh, that uh, makes it necessary for it to use instruments such as derivatives, uh, etc. Of certain, uh, because for instance, uh, they uh, are function as a sort of insurance, for instance, for risks such as currency, exchange rate differentials, um, etc., etc. I mean. Uh, those uh, instruments have been uh, with us for quite some time and uh, the trade and uh, the, the production system uh, globally has, has changed. So this is my provocative uh, challenge to you. Do you think that, I mean, uh, well, you sounded a bit uh, conservative in this way. Do you think it's really so easy to get rid of all these um, um, instruments that uh, kind of have their function in the way how modern economy, and I'm not talking about uh, financial institutions uh, or uh, big investment banks. I'm talking about Slovenian firm, exporter, mm -hmm. who wants to be free of, uh, let's say, uh, exchange rate, uh, differentials, risks, or stuff like that. Well, there's a long hedging is what we're talking about. There's a long tradition. If you think about it, the farmer's got a harvest coming up about he, he uh, doesn't know what the price of his crop is going to be in the autumn when it comes up. He's had to make a judgment. Is he going to 
Is he producing too much? Is he, uh, will, you have a, will the rain come down and hit it before he gets it out? Uh, traditionally, what has happened is quite often farmers have gone to an agent, a bank, and said, up oh, so the bank says, we'll buy the crop at a price now. So the risk is taken out. It doesn't matter what happens in the autumn. Then you've got your cash crop paid for. You've hedged it in advance. That's a, a, a derivative. Right? It's a hedging ahead to ensure that you get a certain level. Of course, there's a payment of a discount. The bank or the person doing that is making a discount because they're now taking on the risk that the crop fails or something like that. This is, doesn't seem to me an instrument that you would ban. This is an instrument which is necessary and could certainly be regulated as part of the process. Uh, uh, you raise again, Marco, the uh, currency risk. Insofar as that the companies have to export, then maybe that, I mean, BP and the big oil companies, many of the car companies in Japan, they buy their uh, exchange rate in advance so that they know what they're going to get on their sales because that reduces it and they obviously banks can make a commission out of that. That seems, uh, I certainly don't know what Philip thinks, but I think that's part of any process of banking which would help uh, to reduce volatility actually. Uh, the irony is that most hedging in derivatives, particularly in financial instruments, because we're not talking about crops, we're not talking about selling cars, we're talking about uh, trying to bet on the price of a financial instrument that you've got, a bond or a, an option on a bond or a, a whole series of other financial instruments, because that's what happened. Back in the 90s, J.P. Morgan and other people said, well, you know this hedging business goes on with uh, corn and money? How about hedging financial instruments or the options on financial instruments? This is a brilliant idea. We think of the money you can make. Nobody's thought about how clever we are. So this whole thing broke out as a way in which to raise really the return that banks could make by betting on the market rather than providing a hedging service for people who need to insure against loss for something that they've actually produced and want to sell. Uh, and they need to do that. So all they have to exchange it into a different currency, whatever the, the risk that the person who's made something or the company that's made something can hedge it is different from companies betting and, or, and this pro hedge fund process of, uh, that's where the word hedge fund comes from, this betting, uh, or, uh, by using this hedging process on these derivatives. Now, that is a different matter altogether. This is totally valueless, totally useless in reducing uh, uh, volatility. In fact, it extended volatility. The, the central bankers at the time, the regulators, Alan Greenspan's famous for this, for saying this, is a, this new form of uh, financial derivatives is actually great news. It means that we can diversify the risk uh, so that if a company, as I said before, if a company, uh, if a bank lends money to mortgage uh, borrowers for their houses, and they've got a lot of mortgages, and some of them might be risky, they can sell them on to other banks and diversify the risk. Well, they certainly did diversify the risk. They made sure that everybody took a hit, and everybody went down together. And so the, the issue of hedging in one sense is not the same as the sort of derivatives that we'll be talking about are really, as uh, Warren Buffett said, instruments, financial instruments of mass destruction. They're poison, they're toxic, they're, they're it's like poison gases, they should be banned. Uh, maybe you too, and then we'll have Lee uh, Brooks here. Um, I would agree. Um, I have termed it to be second and higher layer derivatives can be probably very easily be banned. Um, derivatives on the level where you have really one party involved that needs to hedge a risk, um, I think is necessary. The question is, whom uh, do I allow to take the risk? Because wherever there is a risk, uh, it does not disappear. It just goes somewhere else. And I must have a control of where it is to know where it might pop up when suddenly something happens in the harvest or tsunami. In, an, uh, in a tsunami or in an exchange rate conflict about Russia with what's happening with Ukraine, you know? So, um, with respect to um, exchange rates, I would see some political responsibility of the states themselves. So, we are longly um, advocating clear um, exchange rate agreements between the larger blocks um, to have some confidence of what's going on. Um, on 
issues like weather, it becomes really problematic because we are actually ourselves ruining the weather even more. And that makes more risk. And so the question is, who is going to take it? And so far, you could also argue, in the sum, it is just the publicity as such you can take the risk. Of course, it cannot be just the single farmer uh, responsible for global climate change. You know? um, in lower levels where it can be easily accommodated if there is a 100% loss, I have no problems with uh, leaving that also open to, to investors. But when it comes to, to yeah, piling up huge risks, uh, for example with insurers or something like that, uh, then the issue becomes very tricky and um, yeah. And so far, I would also be careful about, you know, normally when you are in left-wing um, uh, audiences, the worst thing to do is to blame somebody to be a speculator. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, any hedging needs somebody who speculates on that he's actually making a better deal um, if he's awarding the farmer with a fixed price. Mm. And he's uh, producing some kind of a benefit there. It's just a question of how much speculation should be in the in the business, and if uh, it's just speculation about what might be the outcome of speculation on the third level, then I think the whole system starts to become mainly self-referential and thereby too risky. And instruments like that, I think, can be banned. Mr. would you like to add um, something? Well, maybe it would be um, kind of too narrow to think just that. By banning something, uh, things would like automatically get better. We, we are talking here about you know, changing the entire structure yeah. uh, of the economy, and it is somewhat, I think, ironic that yeah, we, we know uh, these commodity derivatives back in the 19th century, but just take a look what happened at, at the commodity uh, uh, markets before the crisis. I mean, uh, commodity futures were driving up the prices of these primary commodities, producing hunger, I mean, real, real uh, catastrophe in, in developing countries, and producing uh, um, macroeconomic imbalances because of the appreciation, uh, currency appreciation in, in, the, in the export countries. So, uh, uh, even in, in, in markets for food and energy, we have financialization. Right? We have financialization of food and, en and energy market. Nothing is safe. So, um, in that sense, I think it's very difficult to um, pinpoint the exact uh, the exact location in which hedging stops and spe speculation begins. I, I think that 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 would be kind of um, sort of technical problem. And for the for the capitalists who are uh, affirming. Uh, financial derivative market, yeah, but the, behind they have this very uh, peculiar theories about how markets work, uh, you know, um, uh, um, 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 financial, uh, um, uh, that is, uh, uh, hypothesis about efficiency of financial markets, uh, with, with various versions, uh, betting on, uh, uh, um, um, relying on the fact that we have all the available information in, in, in a single price, and so um, it's it's not comparable when when you look at it from the heterodox point of view. I, I, I would say. Okay. Um, just a couple of <clears throat> very quick points on this. It is difficult to work out the difference between a, a genuine hedge, which is a, an attempt to minimise a uh, risk on a transaction and what is pure speculation. Um, but uh, I've come across some figures that says that the world GDP, the amount of output that 7 billion people produce, is about $75 trillion. The annual amount of transactions um, is difficult to work out for precisely that reason, how much of it is, uh, is genuine and how much of it is pure speculation. But it's about 1,200 trillion, 1 uh, 1.2 quadrillion uh, dollars, about 15 times as much. So it's quite clear 
that those are not a counterpart to humble farmers, rice farmers <laughs> going to uh, market, worrying about the like price it. of the <laughs> rice next year. The second uh, point is uh, that, um, Michael quoted a book called Andrew Haldane, quite, and, and this man is very quotable uh, Mandarin from the Bank of England. And uh, he was asked about, or he gave the example of something called a CDO squared. Now, as you <coughs> may or may not know, a CDO is a collateralized debt obligation. And a CDO squared is a CDO of a CDO. <laughs> and um, if you don't understand that, all I can say is neither did the people who issued them. Because he says the documentation for such an instrument would run to one million one hundred and twenty five thousand pages and uh, we're not talking about reading Harry Potter here we are talking about advanced mathematical calculations <laughs> so he says with a PhD in maths under one arm and a diploma in speed reading under the other this task would have tried the patience of even the most investigator the vast majority of this stuff is pure froth Okay. Well, uh, I see that we are... Ah, yeah. Well, I'm fine with that, you know, so we just sort it out in Germany. But um, the problem is actually we wanted to see whether this is of any help for the situation we are in this country and how it can be at least partly adopted or what would be some prerequisites. Yeah. So perhaps we can touch slightly on this. Well. Uh, I would like to uh, remind everyone that tomorrow we will have uh, two additional uh, workshops or panels. Um, the one will be uh, about uh, working on a policy document, uh, but it is an open session so everyone can, can join. Um, of course, uh, what uh, Philip says is very, very important because we've been discussing uh, uh, let's say derivatives and uh, highly complex financial instruments but on the other hand we know that uh, the banking crisis or the crisis uh, in the European periphery especially for instance in Slovenia were not caused not even in this superficial uh, manner of speaking by, by, by derivatives uh, the, the financial instrument which was used in countries like Slovenia was the ordinary credit ordinary loan um, the only effect that uh, these uh, global um, uh, changes and mounting uh, financial, uh, financial instruments had on Slovenian economy was very, very uh, remote and would probably have to do with uh, cheap credit rolling uh, into Slovenian banks before the crisis. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, my my uh, my thoughts for tomorrow, more than today, because obviously the time is running out, uh, is that we will try to uh, gather those points on which we uh, seem to agree. And to 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 be very brief, I would say that uh, all of us and some uh, of uh, our other guests who've been discussing this uh, through email. Uh, agree on some sort of nationalization of the, of the banking sector. Uh, we may probably disagree on how much uh, to nationalize, uh, but we all see that nationalization uh, of the, some important banks at least is uh, a crucial uh, condition for, for change or for socialization. Uh, but, of course, we do not want banks, uh, state-owned banks, to function the way that Slovenia <laughs> banks, for instance, had functioned before the crisis, or state-owned banks in other countries have, have, uh, have functioned before the crisis and during and even after the crisis. Because we have to know, we have to be aware, probably no one is speaking about that, but today, at this point, uh, we have the, the weakest uh, social control of the Slovenian state-owned banks. 
These banks are now 100% state owned, but the people, the citizens, have no say in, uh, in how they are run. Everything, uh, you know, the, 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 the democratic uh, opinion or democratic control is bypassed by directives from, from, uh, from Frankfurt, from, from the ECB, or from, from, the, from the European uh, Commission. And, of course, <coughs> Comprador Bourgeoisie uh, that uh, realizes uh, their, their, their plans here. But uh, not to get into this too much, we don't want the banks to function, the state-owned banks to function the way they did. Otherwise, there would be no point in nationalizing them. Obviously. So we have to come up with a different, let's say, business model for those banks. And today we've been discussing quite concretely some of the models used by, let's say, certain development banks and also a certain commercial banks like cooperative sector in Germany. And uh, also some of the, our guests uh, have pointed out the example of uh, North Dakota uh, State Bank, for instance, as a sort of practice in this field. So uh, to come to the Slovenian case, maybe in this sense, look, we have banks nationalized at the moment. Of course, we'll see how long that remains so. But uh, at least for the, for the NKBM. Uh, but uh, we, uh, of course, want, uh, but on the other hand, we don't have this small co cooperative sector. So the, the strategy would probably be uh, start uh, democratizing these larger banks, start putting them uh, to a different function um, than they, uh, they, they uh, like, uh, for instance, in terms of development of the economy and strict control, strict democratic control, the way uh, Michael proposes. On the other hand, there will probably emerge, when this big sector is transformed, there would probably emerge a more favorable condition for cooperative banks, which are per se socialized, um, when, uh, when, when this larger sector is, is uh, transformed. So this point is very important, uh, obviously. Nationalization and then uh, socialization, real social control, which would also mean, uh, but I cannot go into detail, uh, getting a different uh, business model, like, for instance, this classical profit motive will not, will not work. Profitability of the bank, because this, of course, um, gives rise to, to, to risk taking, which is uh, which is dangerous, and uh, in a, in a way grotesque, as as Michael said. And of course, the salaries of this personnel should also be be, be limited. And some of us also agree that um, a lot of people who've been working in this sector, in its, its upper echelons, so to say, in this past 10, 20 years should simply not be doing it anymore. It is not in our state on bank. <laughs> uh, so this is something that we also uh, pretty much agree on. Now, there seem to be some points where we should discuss this further. Um, it's about regulation. It's about what um, Philip was discussing uh, in his talk. Um, and I will just propose a sort of a compromise <laughs> Uh, or a synthesis, if you want, uh, of, of these two, uh, two viewpoints. Of course, as Michael says, I, I think that uh, regulation by itself uh, will not prevent uh, further instability and, uh, and eventually crisis. Of course, this is a capitalist this is a market economy. Um, functionality is a part of it. You cannot have uh, a market economy without it. Well, we can, of course, discuss Keynesianism, but still, we, there is no capitalism without crisis, and no capitalist um, financial sector without crisis, or no market-type uh, financial sector uh, without, without crisis. But what we could do with this kind of, um, let's say, regulation and taxation is to use them as instruments for socializing the banks, because to control the, the, the scale of the banking system is, in a way, planning the banking system. And uh, 
make it more simple, the financial instruments, more easily understood, is one of the, let's say, cognitive preconditions for, for socializing. Because as, as Philip said, you can sit on the, on the board in, in the bank or be uh, a control, in, in, you know, in some form of control, controlling body, but without proper understanding of what's going on, uh, you're totally dependent on the insiders to give you information on uh, what needs to be done. Um, and as well, probably stricter capital requirements once the banks would be nationalized, would might, be, might be a wise instrument to not to entirely avoid the crisis, but still, for instance, in a country like Slovenia, Portugal, and, and countries like that, it would be an important break in times of so-called overheating and of the boom of the credit to, to have sort of certain instruments, a certain automatic stabilizer that would at least prevent uh, this excessive damage uh, that could be prevented by certain policy, policy measures. Uh, and now for the final minute, I would say, of course, tomorrow we will have to come to the, to the, to the case of Slovenia and our other smaller Eurozone member states. Uh, a good introduction to this will be at the morning session, uh, where Dimitrios will also uh, uh, will also take part and uh, Mick, and we'll be discussing the issue of also the issue of the landing of the last result. So I think we should leave that for tomorrow, and uh, we'll also probably uh, have to uh, talk about how to nationalize the banks in technical terms. Michael uh, in his Yesterday lecture, I, I, I was not there, but I uh, was able to read it uh, before. Um, I, I mentions the way how uh, British Labour government after the Second World War did it. You know? So it was a certain form of a buyout. Now, in countries like Slovenia, or in your proposal, it is recapitalization in times of crisis which solves the problem because uh, the, the stocks are cheap at that, at that time. Etc. Etc. So we will we will probably have time uh, tomorrow to, to get uh, into these details. Now um, I cannot see any person with higher authority here, so I will use my jurisdiction to to, to thank you all again for participating today, to invite you uh, to join us uh, tomorrow, and uh, to wish you a pleasant evening.